um, uh, uh, with the, the uh, permanent representation uh, of Ukraine to, to, to the EU. Uh, we host this uh, uh, important seminar dedicated to, to Ukrainian Tatars and in particular their situation after the full-scale invasion of uh, 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 by Russia of, of Ukraine on February uh, 24th of 2022. It is my honor and privilege to welcome His Excellency Ambassador of Ukraine, Sibor Chansov, to, to this uh, event, as well as the EU um, representative for, for uh, human rights, Mr. Emor Gilmore, as well as all uh, distinguished uh, guests, in particular, uh, active uh, in and for for uh, Crimea. Uh, without much ado, I would like to to give the floor to uh, our remote speaker because this seminar is uh, partly in person and partly <clears throat> remote conducted because of of. Uh, important activities of our keynote speakers uh, in uh, uh, Ukraine, in Kiev and elsewhere. First, I would like to give the floor to first Deputy Minister of Foreign Affairs uh, of Ukraine, uh, Emine, Madame Emine Japarova. Uh, is it possible to connect with uh, Madame Minister now? Uh -huh. Okay, that is uh, uh, there. Is, there is a pre-recorded speech. She was not able to to connect uh, and and it will be be uh, uh, delivered in just a moment. What about Refat Chubarov? Uh, so I would like to give the floor to Mr. Refat Chubarov, uh, leader of the, the Medlis of uh, Crimean Tatars, uh, the, the legislative uh, body, elected body the, the, that was uh, so much uh, persecuted by, by Vladimir Putin. And once more, sir. Ja wiem, no, ale, ale słuchamy? Aha, ok. So there is third uh, try. The, we have some problems with, with connection to Rafat Chubarov. And now the, the, the uh, Madame Tamila Tasheva, who is uh, the permanent representative of the president of uh, uh, Ukraine uh, to to the autonomous uh, uh, Crimea. Madame, floor is yours. Do you hear me? Uh, hello, Your Excellencies. Доброго дня, шановні. Good afternoon, colleagues. I will speak Ukrainian, so I would like to ask you to get your headphones, please. Move. Good afternoon. Can you hear me? Would it be possible for you to increase it? Increase it. I don't know. Uh, do you hear me or not? Distinguished colleagues, good afternoon. Un, deux, anglais, anglais, anglais.
Доброго дня, шановні колеги. Доброго дня, колеги, мене чутно чи ні? Дайте мені сигнал, будь ласка. Thank you. Distinguished colleagues, good afternoon. It is a huge honor for me to speak before you today, and I hope that uh, everything's okay with the connection. Unfortunately, I wasn't able to be with you in person, but uh, I would like to send you warmest greetings from the city of Kyiv, from the office of the Ukrainian platform. And uh, what is very important to say is that this event is dedicated to the victims of deportation and genocide of the Crimean Tatar people, and in, in also to the new wave, to the most recent wave of persecution and uh, genocidal practices um, against the Crimean Tatar people. In fact, we can see that after 2014, after the start of the after the start of the invasion uh, and the occupation of the Crimean Peninsula, and after the start of the large-scale invasion in our country, we can see that the persecution um, carried out by the occupation administration, um, how much of it uh, there is against the indigenous people, against the Crimean Tatar people, and the a number of political prisoners speak for themselves. We are talking about 181 political prisoner and uh, 117 of them are Crimean Tatar, I including my uh, great friend, Mr. Mustafaev, and uh, Mrs. Uh, uh, Fatiga is his mentor, and we thank you, you very much for your support. Like my friend uh, Jalalov, who is the deputy of the head of the Majlis, who was apprehended after his participation in the Ukrainian platform. Uh, Rafat Chubarov and other speakers will mention the, about the prosecution and the situation in the Crimean Peninsula uh, that we uh, come up against uh, at the moment. And I wanted to just say a few words about what the Ukrainian state is doing for the protection of the Crimean Tatars and not only for the deoccupation but also for the reintegration of the Crimean Peninsula. I already mentioned that Ukraine has uh, recognized uh, uh, indigenous Crimean um, nations, uh, ethnicities, its uh, uh, indigenous population of uh, uh, Crimea, and we are working on the status of the Crimean Tatar people, and uh, we have been instructed by the president to uh, make the first steps uh, related to the reintegration of the Crimean Peninsula. What do we mean by that? It's the steps related to the a reinstatement of public authority, uh, public governance in the peninsula. Uh, it's working with the um, uh, human resources in Crimea. We wanted to create a team Crimea that will um, restore the, the peninsula, who will become the team who will work in the public authorities and the law enforcement. And of course, um, to make this possible, it's, it's very important to the local population including the indigenous Crimean Tatar people. And this is the second component. We, we work with the experts on communications. We work with other public authorities. ...за колаборативну діяльність на території Криму і напрацювання засад амністії ілюстрації. Ми розуміємо, що територія півострову 9 років була окупована і, відповідно, ми розуміємо, що Звісно, що життя на території Криму продовжувалось, і певна частина людей пішла працювати в окупаційній адміністрації. Тому в наш головний підхід полягає в тому, що 
ті люди, які дійсно винні у вчиненні найтяжчих злочинів проти української держави, проти українських громадян, ті, хто займали управлінські посади в окупаційних адміністраціях, ті, хто зрадили присязі, працювали в правоохоронних органах або судових органах, вони, звісно, що понесуть відповідальність. Частина людей підпаде під засади люстрації на території півострова, решті людей не має чого переживати, тому ми дуже сподіваємося, що найближчим часом ми зможемо відновити контроль на територію Кримського півострову і що наші громадяни, звісно, що будуть підтримувати Україну у досягненні цих цілей, тому що ми завжди говоримо, що ми деокуповуємо не лише територію, а в першу чергу ми думаємо про наших людей. Звісно, що ми працюємо і з рядом інших питань, які пов'язані з відновленням економічного добробуту Кримського півострову. Ключова робота, звісно, що буде одразу після звільнення Кримського Court registers, verification of documents will need to be done. So anything related to the routine life, day-to-day -day life of our citizens. And of course, we will need to bring Ukraine back uh, to Crimea mentally. So we need to bring back the values uh, professed by the... когнітивної деокупації Кримського півострова. І, звісно, що тут провідну роль однозначно грають кримські татари, інші корінні народи, як, як, від, як, права, права яких ми маємо відновити, ми маємо відновити історичну справедливість до цього корінного народу. Я ще... organizers and especially Mrs. Bottega for the, uh, organizing this event and I uh, thank uh, the human rights colleagues very much I'll be I'll stay with you until the end of this meeting and I'm happy to answer any questions that this distinguished uh, audience might have and thank you very much for the invitation thank you very much indeed uh, Madame Tasheva it's good news uh, that you are able to stay connected uh, with us uh, actually uh many uh, persons already present in the room wanted to eventually engage in in discussion so welcome to 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 q a uh, session after introductions uh, can we now listen to to madam minister amina japarova Okay. Now, I'm, I'm very sorry for this complicated uh, beginning of our seminar. That's uh, the fate of remote connections. Uh, I would like to, to give the floor to, to uh, permanent, uh, to, to the EU representative for human rights. Uh, Mr. Amon Gilmore. Thank you very much, uh, Member of the European Parliament, for taking it. And thank you for the invitation to be here with you today. Uh, Ambassador Klentsov, it's always a pleasure to, uh, to be with you. Uh, excellencies, ladies and gentlemen, um, good afternoon to you. It is indeed a privilege uh, to join you here uh, this afternoon. This conference is taking place exactly 15 long months today since Russia started inflicting horrors on the Ukrainian people through its full-scale war of aggression. For eight years before that, Crimea has had its territory annexed and the Crimean Tatars their human rights denied. The European Union did not recognize at the time, does not recognize today, and will never recognize the illegal annexation of Crimea and the city of Sevastopol by the Russian Federation. Today's struggle for all Ukrainians started in 2014 for the Crimean Tatars 
and is a struggle for human rights. War is the greatest enemy of human rights. And we remember that especially this year, because this year is the 75th anniversary of the Universal Declaration of Human Rights. And as we recall the values contained in the Declaration, we also need to remember how it came about. How from the ashes and the destruction of World War II, humanity throughout the world said that this must never happen again. And in Europe, that in turn inspired the creation of the European Union itself. That declaration is perhaps nowhere more relevant today than it is in the whole of Ukraine, where the nightmare of invasion and the human suffering which gave rise to the Universal Declaration has re-emerged. It is in the defence of the values of the Universal Declaration, which the European Union and Ukraine share, that the European Union will continue to provide support to Ukraine in every possible way for as long as it takes. And only yesterday, during their monthly meeting of the Foreign Affairs Council, High Representative Joseph Borrell and the European Union Foreign Ministers exchanged once more on the military support being provided to Ukraine. Our commitment to ensuring full accountability will not waver either. In this context, we welcome the decision taken last week by the leaders at the fourth summit of the Council of Europe to set up a register of damage caused by the aggression of the Russian Federation against Ukraine. The European Union joined that register and has already pledged initial funding for startup costs. Also, we are actively involved in the discussions on the dedicated tribunal for the crime of aggression. The Crimean Tartars were the, were the first victims of Russia's barbarism against Ukraine, having endured a ruthless campaign of persecution since 2014. As of February 2022, that machinery of persecution of the Crimean Tatars has further accelerated. The Russian playbook of repression for Crimea includes arbitrary arrests, torture, enforced disappearances of politicians, activists, journalists, human rights defenders, as well as residents of the peninsula overall. And the international organisations are being denied access. Today, my thoughts go especially to the many political prisoners and civilian detainees Russia has held in Crimea already before 2022. The stories of their relatives and lawyers and the accounts of the lucky ones who were set free remain our call to action as we maintain the same focus on the human rights in Crimea as we do on the situation in every other part of the territory of Ukraine temporarily occupied by Russia. Because human rights belong to the Crimean Tatars in the very same way as they belong to people everywhere else and in every circumstance, and we must all do our utmost to protect them. I have had the privilege of visiting the Crimean platform in Kiev, and I have met on several occasions with representatives of Crimean Tatars, including uh, former political prisoners. For me, today's event on the situation is, is an event on the situation of an indigenous people in a neighbouring country whose needs are tremendous today, but who will one day be part of our family of member states. And I look forward to the day when representatives of Crimean Tatars will sit in this building as members, uh, Ukrainian members of the European Parliament, taking their place among the diverse families of the peoples of Europe. Thank you very much. Thank you very much indeed, Mr. Gilmore. Ambassador Chensov, together with, with me, sits just in front of the uh, European uh, flag, and that is a good sign for, for the future, I think, and, and well represents uh, our will to bring Ukraine as close to the EU as as possible, we'll do our utmost. Uh, I think that now it is possible to listen to, to uh, Amina Japarova, the first Deputy Foreign Minister of Ukraine.
Trulli, should we put on earphones as well? This conference is a sign of recognition and tribute to Crimean Tatar people whose history is an example of struggle and resilience. Before February 24th, the world lived in illusion about Russia. The international community believed that everything can be solved at the negotiation table and continued business as usual with Russia even after it occupied Crimea and parts of Donbass. Crimean Tatars who suffered from centuries-long Russian repressions were not that naive. Detentions, tortures, kidnapping, arbitrary judgments, blackmail are the reality in which my people have been living for nine years. Once prosperous and beautiful, Crimea has become an open air prison. All those who opposed the occupation were labeled religious extremists and terrorists, although until 2014 there had been not a single act of terrorism in Ukraine. Russian missile strikes on Ukrainian cities came along with deterioration of repressions in the occupied Crimea. It worsened even further when Russia understood that finally it will inevitably lose Crimea. Last December, 25-year-old Lenie Umerova was apprehended by Russia at the Russian-Georgian border. She traveled from Kiev to Crimea via a lengthy route through Bulgaria, Romania, Georgia and Russia to care for her father after discovering that he had been diagnosed with cancer. Today, Russia accuses her of being a spy solely because she wished to be with her family in a challenging time. This case serves as a reminder of the countless instances of unfair detentions, convictions, arrests and searches that are the oppressive Russian administration in Crimea has imposed on members of the Crimean Tatars and their representative bodies. What today is taking place in Crimea is nothing but repetition of the history. These days we mark the 79th anniversary of the deportation of the Crimean Tatars ordered by the Stalin's Soviet regime and honoring the victims of the genocide of the Crimean Tatar people. The forced deportation of my people in 1944 took life of every second Crimean Tatar and was an act of genocide that put at risk the very existence of Crimean Tatar people. Soviet regime was transformed into Putin's regime, who greedily occupies Kremlin for over 20 years. This regime is torturing Crimean Tatars to death in prison, as happened to Crimean political prisoners Konstantin Shirin and Jamil Gafarov. It is forcing Crimean Tatars to go to war against their own compatriots. Criminal mobilization is used by Russia not only to prolong the suffering of people in Ukraine, but also to physically exterminate men, representatives of Crimean Tatar people. So-called women's streets, where children are brought up without fathers, became a new reality in Crimea. Today, Crimea and Crimean Tatar people need our support in their struggle. In 2020, we launched a project of public mentoring by internationally renowned persons. Each mentor acts as a public voice in support of one of the detained citizen journalists. It helps us to keep the spirit of our political prisoners high, not to allow them to be forgotten. And I'm glad that one of the mentors is Anna Fatiga. She is with us today. Sarolnas, Sarola Anna Hanum. We expect that more and more influential personalities will follow your example and will be involved as mentors in our initiative. I would love to as mentors in our initiative. I would like to once again express our deep gratitude to our international partners and the European Union particularly Unionist USSR regime, which is guilty in many mass crimes in the 20th century against the people of the Soviet Union and the people in other countries. The most horrible crimes later recognized by the Ukrainian state as a genocide is the Holodomor of 1932-1933. It took lives of almost 4 million human lives. And Surhun, the deportation, as a way to eliminate Crimean Tatars by 
deporting them from their homeland and settling them in horrible conditions in their new settlement. By the end of the Russian-Ukrainian War, after the restoration of the territorial integrity of Ukraine in its international borders, the international community has to adopt a complex of political, legal, economical measures that would exclude an even hypothetical possibility of revenge from Russia. One of such measures should be bringing to liability and punishment of all Russian military and civil officials, propagandists that are masking, disguising with their journalist activity, and other criminals as part of the Russian armed forces and Russian occupation administrations who are guilty uh, in violence and murders on the territory of Ukraine. Another thing is the status of the liberated Crimea as part of the Ukrainian state. It is especially important as Ukraine is preparing to access the European Union that the, memor the, ma that the family of free and uh, liber liberal nations, the Ukrainian politicians and the Ukrainian society needs to understand the values of universal principles of democracy. Based on these principles, we have to uh, develop our independent democratic Ukraine. We have to develop an independent Ukrainian state where the indigenous people, and I have to remind you that all three indigenous people, the Crimean Tatars, Karaims, and Krimchaks, uh, lived on the territory of Crimea, and we need them to receive a non-declarative but a real political, legal and economic guarantee for their development. That predicts a unified position of the Crimean Tatar people. And it consists in the fact that on the territory of the Crimean Peninsula, the Autonomous Republic of Crimea and the city of Sevastopol need to be transformed into a nationally territorial autonomy that will always remain an integral part of Ukraine and that it will act under the authorities set by the Constitution of Ukraine. We are grateful to the deputies of the European Parliament who, for the uh, in the resolution of the European Parliament, dated 11 February 2021, on the association between Ukraine and the European Union, included a clause, I quote here, changes to constitutions recognizing national territorial autonomy of the Crimean Tatar people in Ukraine, which is born out of the right of the indigenous Crimean Tatar people for self-determination. We are convinced that Krim will soon be liberated from the Russian occupiers, that the state sovereignty of Ukraine will be recovered on all its territory inside its internationally recognized borders. We are also convinced that the Russian-Ukrainian war will end with a radical reformation of the world construction of the international security, and this will peaceful development of human civilization. Thank you for your attention. Glory to Ukraine. Thank you very much indeed. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, I...
met many diplomats, Ukrainian diplomats all over the world. Yet I think that uh, resolve uh, and determination of Ambassador Sivorchensov in bringing EU to stay behind Ukraine uh, resolutely and with with such resolve is as much a credit to 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 his activity uh, ambassador floor is yours uh, thank you very much uh, now fatiga and first of all and uh, good good afternoon to everybody first of all i wanted to thank you for this uh, um, consistent and steady of ukraine uh, and it started not uh, 15 months ago, it started much early and uh, in particular keeping Crimean issue high on the agenda of the European Parliament, of European institution in Brussels in general. And uh, you belong to, to, to this uh, category of people who uh, stick to to their cause, whatever it takes, and we appreciate it. And it is not easy to be first to tell the truth. When Adam is getting you mean for you feel modern. But to start, this is a real challenge. And I remember times when the idea of Crimean liberation, the idea of Crimean platform sound, sounded crazy uh, for many people. Uh, and it, it took a lot of courage to, to, go, uh, to go ahead and to push. And as, as it was mentioned uh, earlier, this occupation of Ukraine, it started with Crimea back in 2014. It triggered events in Donbass. And we hope that uh, the liberation of Ukraine mm -hmm. will also start uh, with Crimea, or at least it will not too long uh, to wait for the liberation. And Many, many people in Crimea, outside Crimea, already feel this wind of uh, liberation blowing. And uh, Russian cowards and war criminals, they're scared. And it's good, because the most important is courage and will to win. And who has the will will get means and we are getting those means. We're getting weapons, ammunition, financial resources. And it's not just to protect Ukraine and to help our armed forces, which is definitely the first priority. It's happening because many of our partners really understood what is at stake. Because if you allow the aggressor to grab a part of the territory. And I remember very well those discussions, and uh, I will not name and shame, but you, you remember yourself, keeping our hands, saying, don't do anything in 2014. If they move further, then we will do something. And it was a huge mistake. And we need to avoid this mistake now, accepting this logic, okay, just uh, maybe this territory or that territory. In history, there have been a lot of compromises. Why don't you consider? It's not just about territory. This is important to understand uh, to those who enter into those difficult, uh, dangerous waters. It's about principles because what Russia is doing, Russia is looking for the reason, to, for justification of this war. 
And this war, and the same goes for Crimea in 2014, has no justification. You cannot bring any argument why Russia is entitled for one centimeter of Ukrainian territory. And we will stick to this principle. And uh, this, is, this, is how, uh, this is how our leadership uh, uh, explain the situation and how Ukrainian people feel it. Uh, I, I wanted also to say a few words about uh, anniversary of deportation of Crimean Tatars. Uh, this is the pattern of Russian behavior. 70 years, 79 years ago, one year ago, it's oppression, uh, war crimes, negligence to the, to the human being. And we, we already suing Russia. Russia already uh, has, has to, uh, to, to appear in the court. Uh, we have an ongoing case in The Hague uh, based on the Convention of Racial Discrimination and Elimination of uh, Finance of Terrorism. And when we are talking about rights of Crimean Tatars, and Ukrainians in Crimea, uh, we consider uh, Russia, what Russia is doing as a violation of this convention and uh, on rational discrimination, and we are talking about political, cultural, and other rights which are violated. And uh, what is also important to remember, uh, Mr. Chubarov, uh, he's a chairman uh, of, of Mijlis, which is banned now by the Russian Federation. And Russia is violating not the, the abstract, not the abstract uh, law. Uh, Russia is violating now the decision of the International Court of Justice, which ordered Russia to stop this violation and allow Mijlis to function. So, it's already for uh, five years. Russia is in breach with the decision of, of International Courts of Justice. And it's one of the many decisions, I'm sure, which Russia will have to implement. And it's an example that international justice works. So we need to push further and to build coalition to bring Russia to responsibility and its leadership and personally everybody who committed crimes in Ukraine, including Crimea, to justice. We have to make sure that Russia pays for all devastation and losses in Ukraine. It could take Two, three generations, doesn't matter. But Russian people, they also need to understand that they're paying for being passive, for accepting uh, this, the, the status quo for what is happening in Russia, for accepting what the leadership is doing against Ukraine. We are talking about individual criminal responsibility, but Russians need to understand that this is also their responsibility, what their regime is doing, not only Ukraine, but to Ukrainians, but to other countries. This is how this world should function, and uh, we will work and achieve justice. So once again, I, I wanted to thank all of you for participation in this event. Uh, Ukraine will win. We will win together. Slava Ukraini. Ambassador Chansov.
Ambassador Chansov, Excellency, thank you very much indeed for, for your remarks. Surely all of us believe uh, Ukraine uh, wins. Not only we believe, we think it is uh, absolutely necessary and inevitable and therefore we we put uh, all our efforts to to enable this in our mm, okay, uh, capacities uh, before i hand over to 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 um, moderator madam tatiana uh, i would like to to uh, say at least few, two things uh First, uh, that we commemorate uh, deportations of uh, Crimean Tatars, uh, but but we have to remember that uh, uh, this kind of atrocities happened to to, to Crimean Tatars uh, in uh, Tsarist era by 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 Tsarist Russia as well as. Uh, uh, during uh, the Soviet Union by by Stalin, and and now by Russian Federation, it is well known pattern. First, uh, oppression, destabilization, oppression, aggression, invasion, ethnic cleansing, and then all over the world, promoting the principle of self determination. We clearly say uh, territorial integrity of Ukraine and hopefully Crimean Tatars, all prisoners, wherever they are able to, to return to, to, to their homes. Um, uh, and secondly, uh, in the long history of Poland, there were instances when Crimean Tatars uh, found their uh, living in, in Poland. Krusiniany are well known and area of eastern Poland is well known close to Białystok, but uh, uh, there is also a smaller community of Crimean Tatars in my constituency in Pomerania region in Gdańsk in particular, that is also my, my home city. And uh, maybe because of this, but, but obviously for, for, for many other reasons, uh, I feel so much dedicated to, to uh, uh, fighting for, for their cause, uh, as well. Um, now I would like to, to, to hand over the moderation of next part of this, uh, conference, uh, to, to Mrs. Tatiana Bahonczyk, who is the, uh, leader of, of the human rights, uh, uh, centers Mina here in in Brussels uh, in in uh, uh, well uh, given to 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 Ukrainian NGOs uh, by the European Parliament. Madame Fleur is yours. Madame Fotiga, thank you very much for uh, making this event uh, happen and uh, for all your efforts uh, directed at the support of the Crimean Tatar political prisoners, but also for uh, all the support that Poland is providing to Ukraine and this struggle that Ukraine and Poland are doing uh, hand by hand to liberate Crimea and to protect uh, the indigenous uh, people of Crimea, Crimean Tatars. I'm honored to moderate uh, this part uh, of uh, our uh, uh, discussion and uh, we will hear uh, another distinguished panel 
uh, historians, researchers, human rights defenders, uh, journalists and relatives uh, of uh, political prisoners, uh, which will give us uh, their perspectives on the events uh, which are happening and also on the historic implications of uh, the uh, repressions and the deportation from Soviet times to the modern and nowadays, nowadays events. And hopefully we will have also two online speakers, one from Crimea and one from Kiev. I hope that they will be able to connect and join us. Last week, uh, Ukraine uh, with the rest of the world marked the day of the remembrance of the victims of the genocide of Crimean Tatar people. Uh, as it was mentioned this day, 79 years ago, uh, Soviet authorities uh, started ethnic cleansing of uh, Crimea and genocide of Crimean Tatars. This crime of Joseph Stalin, Lavrenti Beria and other Soviet war criminals went unpunished and came back again. Today, uh, Crimean Tatars are facing new waves of uh, repressions and persecutions in Crimea, which started in 2014, starting, start, starting from abductions and enforced disappearances, torture, uh, politically motivated persecutions, court trials, uh, and now uh, accompanied by the wave of uh, forced conscription and mobilization to the Russian army, when many young Crimean Tatar men uh, 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 chose to leave uh, Crimea uh, not to be mobilized to Russian army. As uh, my colleague Tamila Tasheva mentioned, out of 181 political prisoners from Crimea, uh, 117 are uh, of uh, Crimean Tatar origin, including also our close friends and colleagues. So uh, we might say that history teaches us if there is no justice, the crimes uh, will come back again. And I would like to uh, invite our first speaker, uh, uh, historian uh, Gulnara Abdullaeva, to speak uh, about historic implications and modern situation of Crimean Tatars. Uh, Gulnara uh, is uh, also working at the Crimean Tatar TV channel ATR. So, Gulnara, please, the floor is yours. Greetings and thank you very much for the support for Ukraine and Ukrainian uh, peoples, including the Crimean Tatars. What is happening in the occupied Crimea today, unfortunately, has its own history that started in uh, 1783 when Crimea was first occupied. And then its indigenous people, the Crimean Tatars, were under a real threat of extermination. And any resistance was accompanied by terror, massacres, and violence. In the first year, according to official data, more than 30,000 Crimean Tatars were killed, those who resisted the occupiers. Of course, that's, uh, it, it must have been a lot more than uh, this number. The Crimean Tatars uh, called the period of annexation the Black Age. They lost their states, their lands, their privileges, and their right to freedom. The occupiers began interfering in religious affairs, taking away their land and forcing them to leave uh, the peninsula. This process became a real demographic catastrophe for the people. Those who remained were under a total, total supervision of uh, Russian officials in Crimea uh, until 1917. The October Revolution brought uh, about global changes and had already been a galaxy of prominent Crimean Tatars uh, that had emerged by then. But the victory uh, fell to the Bolsheviks, who pursued a consistent policy of terror against the Crimean Tatar population of Crimea. On the 17th of April, 1938, this day went down in history of the Crimean Tatar people as the Black Day. During three days in Simferopol, the NKVD executioners um, executed dozens of the brightest Crimean Tatars public figures. The real purpose of the uh, execution was to destroy the authoritative representation of the Crimean Tatar intelligentsia, the politicians, teachers, writers, scientists, journalists, artists, etc. So those who were the opinion uh, influences of the Crimean Tatars. As a result, 
um, Crimean Tatar historians attribute the consequences of this tragedy to the deportation of the Crimean Tatar people of 1944. And I'm grateful to people who speak up against the deportation. This is a terrible, a tragic page in our history. Unfortunately, there won't be enough time to, to tell you about everything that happened. But after Crimea was uh, deoccupied, uh, in 1944, uh, in May, the whole of the Crimean Tatar population was deported. It was a moral and a physical destruction of the nation. At the time when the best sons of the Crimean Tatar people were dying, elderly people, women and children were accused of collaboration and they were deported to Central Asia and to the Urals. 46.2% of the people died, and this was a real genocide of the Crimean Tatar people. In fact, from the very first years, the Crimean Tatars persistently demanded the restoration of their rights. And during this period, the national movement came about. Uh, the Crimean Tatars wanted to return to their homeland. In 1956, Crimean Tatars were removed from the register of special settlers and released from administrative supervision. However, this did not absolve them of the charges, of the, of the accusations of collaboration, did not give them right to return to Crimea. An active struggle to restore their rights began. Crimean Tatar people needed a homeland. They needed an ethnic territory, a native language, material and spiritual culture. The national movement of the Crimean Tatars chose a non-violent way of struggle, and it basically broke the Soviet system. It achieved the return of the people uh, to their homeland. And despite the fact that this was a difficult path, most Crimean Tatars began to return to Crimea from the places to which they were deported, in, uh, and this was happening in the 1990s. And then on the 26th of June, 1991, in Simferopol, the second Kurultai began its work, and the Kurultai elected their, um, the Crimean representative, the supreme representative body of the Crimean Tatar people, the Majlis. It was then that the Crimean Tatars self-determined to be a part of independent Ukraine. A little over 20 years later, and the Ukrainian Crimea in 2014 suffered another terrible tragedy, a second Russian occupation. In fact, from the very first months, there was a wave of political persecution, searches and arrests, and mainly uh, among the Crimean Tatars. The Majlis was um, declared to be an extremist organization, and a part of their representatives were forced to leave the peninsula, and those who remained in Crimea were jeopardized. And not only them, anyone who disagrees with the occupation of Crimea, who is sympathetic with Ukraine, who is uh, religiously motivated is subject to Russian repression. Criminal cases were falsified against these people, they fabricated against them, abductions uh, were used, torture was, was used, and long prison sentences are meted out. My friend and colleague Nariman Jalal is in, currently held in detention. The Akhtemov brothers and many other uh, other people. The deputy head of Majlis stayed in Crimea since the start of the occupation. He was the voice of freedom. It was very clear from the very beginning that the occupying authorities will never forgive him uh, his civic pro-Ukrainian position, but he never left Crimea and he's been active in supporting all those who are now hostages of the Kremlin. After the uh, Crimean platform in September 22, um, another search came to his home. He was taken and uh, um, he was uh, he, he was taken taken to an unknown location. Later, he was accused in the um, blowing up of a gas pipeline near Simferopol. He was accused of a act of terror. Of course, he and his colleagues have nothing to do with it, but the occupiers needed uh, a high-profile case. But they didn't achieve what they wanted. 
he is being kept in detention in um, um, facility number two in Simferopol. We hope very much that he and his colleagues will be exchanged for uh, Russian uh, captives. One day of Russian uh, occupation is uh, is like a year lost from your life. Unfortunately, since the outbreak of the full-scale war of the, on the 24th of uh, 24th of February 2022, t Crimea, uh, the terror in Crimea has intensified. It's already spreading to new Russian occupied territories. Uh, as we can see, history is repeating itself. And if together with the whole world we do not stop Russia now, this mass terror will continue and will be become much larger. My Crimean Tatar people hopes that very soon we will be able to meet in a free Crimea and we will all say glory to Ukraine. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Hulnara, for the work uh, that you do to preserve and tell Crimean Tatar history, but also uh, to fight for the release of Nariman Jalal and other political uh, prisoners. And we hope that uh, they will be released uh, soon. And uh, in the meanwhile, I would like to give a floor to uh, our online speaker uh, from Kyiv, uh, uh, Eskander Bariyev. He is a human rights defender, a member of the Majlis of Crimean Tatar people, and uh, Eskander uh, represents the Crimean Tatar Resource Center. Uh, so please, uh, Eskander, the floor is yours. You can share with us uh, the information uh, that was collected by your organization about uh, the persecution of uh, Crimean Tatars in Crimea. So please, the floor is yours. Thank you, Tatiana. I would like to thank all of the nations of the European Union for the support for Ukraine in this very difficult time when the whole of the Ukrainian people is fighting for its right to live, for its sovereignty, is fighting evil that is jeopardizing the whole uh, of humanity. Crimean Tatars became the minority in their own homeland. And we are the uh, subject to a uh, the policy of genocide. And uh, we have we, we had in our history the forced deportation in 1944. And this policy uh, has continued now since 2014, since uh, Russia started occupying Crimea. They're replacing the population. They are being intimidated. Crimean Tatars being intimidated, and is being pushed out of Crimea as a non-loyal population. Six hundred thousand Russians have been brought in from Russia to Crimea, and around one hundred thousand pro-Ukrainian citizens have had to leave Crimea. This is a direct violation of uh, the fourth provision of the Geneva Convention. In 2014, we understood that either the whole world follows universally recognized civilized rules or we follow the principle of might is right, which jeopardizes the whole of the human civilization. In 2022, what we saw as a grave violation of inter international law, we saw a large-scale aggression against the sovereign sovereign state, um, and we see a genocide of the Ukrainian population. We see war crimes committed in the territory of Ukraine. To the classification of our resource center. 227 political uh, prisoners are being kept in uh, Crimea. 195 of them are Crimean Tatars. 167 are inmates. 100 of them are Crimean Tatars. 37 are on probation. 19 of them are Crimean Tatars. 32 are um, being investigated. 60 has died uh, over the period of occupation. 27 are indigenous Crimean Tatars. And these trends, I, I want to identify these trends. There, we've identified 18. We don't have enough time to talk about all of them, so I will just tell you about the key, um, key trends that we saw in 2022. Apart from the violation of human rights that we continue to see since 2024, we have registered 
a number of war crimes committed by a Russian military in the newly occupied territories. Um, also, a number of um, political prisoners, their POWs, and there's a third category now, civil hostages who have been deprived of their freedom. Previously, activists in Crimea were warned by the Russian uh, authorities, but we see that in 2022 to 2023, uh, the Russian uh, occupying authorities are using administrative punishments, fines and arrests. The occupiers have created new instruments for the persecution of Ukrainian citizens. Over the, uh, this period, the Supreme Court of the Russian Federation approved the decision to uh, recognize the battalion of the Crimean Tatar Battalion and Extremist Organization. And the Russian courts are now meeting out sentences uh, who are uh, to, to people who were apprehended in, in, in the case against this battalion, which is a um, violation of the third uh, provision of the Geneva Convention. Also, they are prosecuting people for, uh, quote unquote, discrediting the Russian armed forces, and they're meeting out administrative punishments and criminal punishments. So they've introduced into the administrative code and into the criminal code uh, these punishments. In 2022, they first used Article 20, Amendment 3 of the Administrative Code uh, on propaganda or demonstration of the Nazi uh, symbols or uh, attributes. Since the start of the occupation, the occupiers have been using uh, punitive psychi psychiatric treatment against uh, one of our colleagues who, who, was, um, um, who was kept in a psychiatric hospital for five years. Um, political prisoners are then sometimes deported to uh, Russia. In 2022, um, there has been a, there was a partial mobilization uh, carried out in Crimea, and uh, the occupiers are currently looking for persons of Crimean Tatar origin who are avoiding mobilization for the Russian armed forces. In 2022, occupiers and uh, the occupying media um, announced that they've uncovered cells, Hezbollah his, his uh, Tahrir cells. Hezbollah uh, Tahrir really is an instrument to intimidate the Crimean Tatars and to prosecute them. What can we do? What can we do right now and what needs to be done? I wanted to give you a few recommendations. First of all, to bring pressure to bear on the Russian Federation and to improve the mechanism of monitoring of the uh, implementation of the sanctions. To introduce a mechanism of personal sanctions regarding persons who are responsible for violation of human rights, um, similar to the Magnitsky Act. Uh, Act and we are um, consistently providing the list of these people. Secondly, to intensify human rights um, protection in uh, Crimea. For example, um, prominent public figures could uh, um, look out for particular uh, individual prisoners. And I'd like to thank Mrs. Fotiga for being an example of a mentor of this kind. Next, to work with international lawyers in order to defend political prisoners who are detained in the Russian Federation. Next, to elaborate a plan of action to improve the situation of uh, the indigenous people and to work with uh, the Council of Europe and the OSCE to improve the re, um, response mechanism of the UN to the situation in uh, in uh, Crimea to ensure their presence in the courts uh, when the Crimean Tatar cases are heard. Uh, to help Crimean Tatar representatives in third countries, those who are uh, evading mobilization in the occupied Crimea. And seeing as this event is dedicated 
to the 79th anniversary of the deportation, can I just remind you that uh, next year we will be marking the 80th anniversary. And uh, we would like to recommend to uh, to the European countries to recognize the deportation of 1944 as an act of genocide and to um, to condemn the persecution, the violence against Crimean Tatars by the Russian Federation and the occupied Crimea. I think this would be an important indicator that indeed Crimean Tatars have the whole of the civilized world on their side, and we condemn all of these crimes that were committed then because if it wasn't it wasn't condemned yesterday and it's happening again today and we're not only just fighting for our rights and for our freedom we are on the front line of uh, the fight against uh, authoritarian regimes we can see these uh, egregious violation of human rights in Crimea by combating this we will not just defend the whole world thank you Chair Eskander, for the work that your organization is doing to collect. And, uh, un uh, unfortunately, these uh, numbers are growing all the time. And uh, uh, the last release uh, when uh, p Crimean political prisoners were liberated was uh, in 2019, uh, together with Oleg Sensov and group of other political uh, prisoners. But after that, no one was released, and uh, the lists uh, are 19 uh, together with Oleg Sensov and group of other political uh, prisoners. But after that, no one was released, and uh, the lists uh, are only uh, growing. And uh, I'm glad that uh, today uh, the uh, brother of, uh, polit of the political prisoner Lenie Umerova uh, is present with us that he made his travel uh, with us uh, from Kiev. Uh, it is uh, Aziz Umerov and uh, I would like to give a floor to him as we think uh, uh, even given the fact that there are hundreds of political prisoners it is very important to tell every single story and to fight for the release of every person so please uh, uh, aziz uh, the floor is yours thank you salam alaikum vitayu всех salam alaikum greetings to everyone who is present here today i greet you in the language of the ukrainian crimea uh, these two words, Salam Aleikum, means I wish you peace. And this is the peace that Ukraine is currently fighting for, being a shield for the whole of Europe against aggression, violence and lawlessness, which Russia represents. My name is Aziz Umerov. I'm a citizen of Ukraine and a Crimean Tatar, a Ukrainian law enforcement officer. I'm the son of my brave father, who, despite his illness and other difficulties, remained uh, living in his native land under occupation. I am the son of my courageous mother, who, is, who also continues to live in Crimea, waiting for her children who have chosen the path of struggle in the hope of returning Crimea to Ukraine, which is a guarantee of human rights in general and the rights of indigenous peoples in particular. I'm also an older brother, the older brother of Lenia Umerova, a 25-year-old girl who is now known throughout Ukraine. My sister was imprisoned by the Russians for no reason. They grabbed her when she was crossing the border between Georgia and Russia, heading to the occupied Yevpatoria uh, to care for uh, her father, who has cancer. Because of the Russians, her journey home turned into a denial of freedom and uh, charges of espionage. Our President Volodymyr Zelensky knows and speaks about it. Mm. First, Deputy Foreign Minister Emine uh, Jabbar uh, tells the Crimean platform participants about Lenia. And Jamala, our singer, uh, remembered her in Liverpool at the Europe uh, European uh, Eurovision Song Contest. The Kremlin is keeping Lenia in the FSB Lefortovo prison in uh, complete information isolation. Can you please show the video? Can you please? Have a look. This is footage when my um, sister is being taken to prison by those who should be in prison right now.
My sister used to work in social media, and I think many of you have assistants who manage your social media. And imagine that one day they will just be put behind bars for no reason. And I'm sure that in this situation you would make every effort to help. And I'm asking you to take Lenia's story uh, and the hundreds of other similar stories of political prisoners. As a, take it to heart as if it was your child's teacher that was kidnapped or your favorite blogger or journalist or the person who makes your coffee every day. They are held in captivity simply because their views are inconvenient for the terrorist state. And I call on the European Union to respond decisively because human rights are the foundation of a modern developed world and a key value of democracy. We in Ukraine right now are fighting for peace and the triumph of democracy and we ask you to fight for our people. I call on the European Union to demand for the release of my sister and all illegally detained Ukrainian citizens to create efficient mechanisms for the release of civilian prisoners held by Russia, create mechanisms to ensure that the leaders of the Russian Federation and all the war criminals are brought to justice and to systematize the data of all persons involved in the illegal detention and ill treatment of civilians and impose personal sanctions against them. I ask all of you to support political prisoners. I also appeal to the politicians, journalists, activists, human rights defenders and civil society organizations. Please join us in covering the story of my sister and hundreds of other political prisoners and prisoners of war. I thank you for your attention and hope to see you in the free Ukrainian Crimea. Thank you, Aziz, uh, for your courageous work and for the work of many families of political prisoners, including those who reside in Crimea and who are fighting for the destinies of their lovely members of their families and uh, just to have a possibility to see them and to hug them. And as human rights defenders, uh, for, as for human rights defenders, for us it's clear that uh, there are no effective mechanisms for the protection of human rights in Crimea. It is only the, the occupation uh, and liberation of the Crimean Peninsula. Uh, but when we speak about all these uh, crimes, uh, persecutions, repressions, uh, they are also now are scaled up uh, and uh, uh, they are um, uh, implicating and repeating again at the newly occupied territories of Ukraine. Now we see another modern deportation uh, from the newly occupied territories. And all these crimes started in Crimea and uh, it will be not possible without the um, informational, huge informational uh, campaign, uh, which was fueling the hate speech and inc incitements to genocide. Uh, my colleague Irina Sedova, uh, she is originally from Crimea, from Kerch. Uh, in 2014, uh, she was forced to leave Crimea and uh, their human, uh, Crimean human rights group now works in exile uh, on the mainland Ukraine. Uh, but they have the network of uh, domestic monitors in Crimea and throughout all these years of occupation, they are able to document and collect uh, human rights abuses uh, in Crimea. Uh, I would like to give a floor to Irina so she can share with us uh, their latest uh, research uh, and facts that they documented. Please. Thank you for your attention. Since the beginning of the full-scale invasion in February 2022, repressions uh, in the occupied peninsula have intensified. And this is another threat, uh, additional threat for the people who are staying, who are not loyal to the Russian Federation and the occupiers. Repressions are now directed against uh, even those who were, um, were not affected during the occupation. These people are punished for being involved in any kind of civic activity, including Crimean Tatars, because because they're the first ones to suffer from these repressions. And then Suleimanov, who is a civil, a civil journalist, has a heart condition. He remained uh, under home arrest. A case was falsified against him, and after the large scale invasion, he has been thrown behind bars, and his health 
is deteriorating. Even by Russian laws, he shouldn't be behind bars in this condition. Another journalist was thrown behind bars. Um, they are also persecuting journalists who talk about the violation of uh, the human rights of uh, Crimean people. Crimean Tatars are completely unprotected because there's no one who who can talk about it. Irina Danilovich, a civil journalist, uh, was simply kidnapped in broad daylight in the street and uh, a criminal case was falsified against because uh, she was tortured and information was obtained um, under uh, duress. She was sentenced to seven years of prison simply for writing uh, uh, texts on the internet. And this is not just an isolated case. There are other 15 journalists and bloggers who were arrested exactly for their journalist activities. Maybe they were arrested for other um, um, violations, but in fact, the violation is just that they were trying to speak about the truth. As my colleagues have already mentioned, uh, almost 200 people are political prisoners, mainly Crimean Tatars, because they are not afraid to speak up publicly um, against the Russian occupation. All of these people are absolutely innocent. It's, they simply uh, were not liked by the occupiers because they uh, have respect for their fellow citizens, like Mr. Jalal, because they're civil activists. And this situation requires attention from the international community because these people are subjected to torture, inhumane treatment in these uh, places of detention. The conditions are horrifying. These people are being um, subjected to a pressure, a terrible pressure, simply for being Crimean Tatars uh, or Ukrainians. For the past year, the Russians have been kidnapping activists in the Kherson region, uh, including Crimean Tatars, who uh, they are accusing of belonging to the Crimean Tatar battalion. They've declared a terrorist organization, although this battalion did not take part in any hostilities at all. The only thing they did is declaring publicly that Crimea is Ukraine. So this is a 100% politically motivated case. Other people, volunteers, activists are persecuted for exactly the same thing, for helping Ukrainians. There's even an EU citizen amongst them. There's a Spanish citizen volunteer, Maria Garcia Catayud. Uh, and our sources are telling us that he's currently held in CISO uh, number two in Simferopol, although the occupation authorities are of the Crimea will not admit to it. We know that he was trying to help Ukrainians uh, after the large-scale invasion. That's his only crime. Unfortunately, the Russian Federation feels uh, impunity for committing all these crimes, and we must make every effort to bring to justice all the war criminals who are committing these crime, uh, crimes against the civilian population of Ukraine every day, who pursue a genocidal policy, trying to destroy us as a people. We must make every effort to bring each of them to justice for this unjust war against Ukrainians and Crimean Tatars. Just another thing I wanted to say, all of these crimes against humanity will, would not have been possible without conscious preparation by the Russian citizens to this kind of behavior, because the Russian authorities are giving them permission to commit uh, murder and genocide. We have seen this over the uh, eight years of the occupation. We have seen the stoking of hatred against the Crimean Tatars by the Russian media. And I wanted to tell you about the main methods and the main vocabulary of this hate speech. Which we conducted this research um, together with a professor from the Kiev Mohila Academy. These, uh, this hate speech is a crime now because they are calling for openly, publicly, for genocide of uh, Crimean Tatars. And we hear this from the Russian, mainstream Russian media. And these messages are uh, spread by influ influential people who have large audiences, by influential Russian media who are uh, spreading this, these messages to large numbers of people. And then this gives permission to the Russian soldiers to commit crimes. Uh, in the lands that uh, they've occupied. All of this evidence is being collected in order to then be handed over to the international criminal authorities and to national um, uh, investigative authorities. This is the genocide, ca calls for genocide from Russian influential public figures that we hear every day. Unfortunately, they remain unpunished. 
and this is why I wanted to appeal to all of you, help Ukraine in this war against Russian Federation, help us not only to defend ourselves, but to, to liberate ourselves. Because at the moment we will not be able to convince Russia to recognize its guilt. We need to maintain, not only to maintain help for Ukraine, but to increase it so that this horrifying war would end as soon as possible and all of the uh, res those who are responsible for war crimes would be called to account. The sanctions that have implemented against the Russian Federation for its aggression and lawful and unjust war of aggression against Ukraine, we m must ensure that these sanctions are as efficient as possible, that all countries adhere to them and comply with them. Because unfortunately, journalists have been recording cases when sanctions are being circumvented by the shell companies. This includes shell companies registered in the European Union, and they continue to sell um, various spare parts, components to the Russian military industrial complex, and they continue to build missiles and launch these missiles at the civilian population. Now in Kiev, we sleep in the hallways in our homes because we are subjected to missile attacks every other day. That's very terrifying. And we hope that the European Union will increase its control over the um, implementation of sanctions and will punish those who will try to circumvent uh, these sanctions. Only your support will allow us to survive in this war that looks like very much like a genocide of the Ukrainian people and the Crimean Tatar people. For us, it's also uh, very important to, to hear uh, these people, uh, human rights defenders, journalists who... Uh, even despite all these harsh conditions, uh, persecutions, pressure, continue to work in Crimea. Uh, there are some grassroots initiatives and groups uh, like Crimean Solidarity that unites families of political prisoners and lawyers, like Crimean Process that monitors uh, politically motivated court trials. Uh, uh, there are also uh, some number of uh, independent small media that, uh, despite all the circumstances, uh, continue to work in Crimea. And uh, I hope that uh, we, we will be able to uh, connect and uh, listen to uh, one of uh, such uh, journalists. It is uh, Bekir Mahmoud. He is an uh, uh, editor-in-chief of the Crimean Tatar newspaper uh, Krim, uh, Crimea. Uh, uh, Bekir Aha, uh, uh, якщо ви нас чуєте, будь ласка, uh, вам слово. Дякую. Шановні пані та панове, звичайно, я хотів би обратитися. Хвилиночку. We cannot hear you. Спробуйте ще раз. Can we try again, please? You have to unmute. микрофон себе від Так, будь ласка. Не чути, ще раз спробуйте. Так. Шановні пане та панове. Ladies and gentlemen. Thank you. Of course, I wanted to speak to you in my native tongue. But for now, I can only say the following words. On the 10th of February, in Novocherkas Detention Center, 60-year-old Simferopol resident Jamil Gafarov passed away. Five years ago, he uh, was disabled because of kidney disease, and prior to that, he had a massive heart attack. And this was no deterrence. Uh, when he was accused of crimes, unthinkable uh, crimes, even from the political point of view. In fact, he was uh, a very kind man who wouldn't hurt a fly, as we say. And on the 11th of January, completely confident of his absolute innocence, he listened he calmly listened to his relatively short prison and a sentence in comparison to the sentences of many other of his compatriots. So this is a moderate sentence, only 13 years. He was punished for simply talking and reasoning about the social order, and he was punished with full knowledge of, the, uh, of his health condition, punished 
with the knowledge that the conditions of his imprisonment would lead to his death. And he was punished to the fullest, like he was a um, um, f able-bodied serial killer. And this dramatic and egregious case is well known, not only to human rights defenders and, uh, and to journalists and polit politicians, but to everyone who follows events in Crimea. These are giant sentences, um, sentences they came back from the Stalin uh, era, albeit politically reprehensible in the eyes of the authorities, they, they were passed and imposed on dozens of Crimean Tatars, and together these sentences comprise a thousand years. The shock with which the first uh, sentences were um, uh, received, the shock has now passed. And for several years now, they've been recorded and they've been retold. They don't arouse the uh, same emotions, only a practical response. And there are reasons for this. In Crimea, behavioral actions uh, have been fraught with fines at best, and the minimum fine is the average monthly salary, and worst, worst case, a prison sentence. It is slightly less than sentences for those who would, we would like to speak up for today. In this connection, I remind, if, if I may, that uh, just for his appearance in the evening of uh, September 4th, 2022, uh, near the building of FSB in Simferopol, with absolutely harmless, sincere question, where our relatives and friends, Nariman Jalal, brothers Asan Naziz Akhtemov, were taken away by the law enforcement officers the day before, without an explanation and unknown direction. People were um, uh, detained and 60 protocols were initiated and admi administrative cases on these protocols despite their appeals added one and a half million rubles to the state budget that's around 22,000 US dollars we had a comedy character he used to say learn um, take note and learn but the situation is very far from comical. It is profoundly and enduringly tragic. The attempts to assert the rights, be it of a, uh, of a individual human being or a collective or a, a national human rights, in all senses uh, are extremely costly and have grave moral and physical consequences. I expect that you know that our compatriots, whose names I have mentioned, caught between 13 and 17 years of prison sentences. And the, uh, they were never at the place uh, where the crimes that uh, they're accused of were committed. They don't even know what this place is. The damage to the gas pipeline was calculated, and it is around 100,000 rubles. And the people who went uh, to the streets in the evening of the um, September, uh, September 4th now paid 15 times that in fines, but no, it is necessary to punish the satisfied for a civil, their civil position and um, to meet out their, uh, and to ensure their silence. They got 45 years of, of imprisonment for three people. And uh, recently, the beginning of May, after another 12-day detention for disobedience during a search in his own home, Abdurashid Jeparov was released. He's a well-known uh, human rights activist, activist. And a few days ago, he received what we call letters of happiness um, or court summonses. These two summonses instruct him to turn up to very, two different uh, court hearings. In one of them, he is accused of the abuse of freedom of speech, same as me two years ago and in the other for creating fakes or defamation um, which is purely ideological in their function. I'm not going to generalize from what I have said, but uh, only because of the fact that they are fraught with consequences. There is absolutely nothing new or secret in these facts. But also, it is obvious that uh, there's a sad predictability uh, in all of these cases. 
against the socio-political and historical background uh, of what happened in Crimea, and first of all concerning Crimean Tatars after May 1944, and in the context of how colossal was Moscow's, Moscow's influence in the peninsula all of this time, regardless of the decisions of 1954, and uh, seeing as it remained in the Soviet, in the post-Soviet period, today's realities are hardly surprising. Most of the local ethno-conglomerate diaspora community, reinforced by the mass relocation of recent years, has not been and is not at all concerned by the core values outlined in the Universal Decla Declaration of Human Rights or in the similar um, documents such as the European Convention on Human Rights. All of this, from the point of view of people who live here, is bad, harmful Western tricks. And the stricter the control of the freedom of speech, the better, and uh, the more it is in the interest of this community. So media diktat is seen as useful and expedient. It neutralizes the um, schemes of the enemy. It was in the 90s, 1990s, where some timid attempts were made at democratization in Russia. We witnessed here a fierce, rigidly pro-communist attack uh, against any liberal views or sympathies. And the fact that Yeltsin was widely hated in Crimea for his anti-communism in the 1990s, this fact is well known. My point is that the current climate of repression and persecution has uh, um, found fertile soil uh, to the the fact that few people are outraged by the lack of independent courts, the suppression of elementary rights, um, to the security of the person, freedom of speech, opinion and expression, peaceful assembly, expression of will, and the list goes on. For 25 years, we have gathered by the ten, tens of thousands uh, in the central square of Simferopol on May 18th, the day of the morning. And over this time, no one was so much as uh, hit or not a drop of blood was spilled um, for 25 years what it has been happening since 2014 we all know and if on this significant day for the whole people we're not able to get together and say a prayer together and to remember all the innocents who died in the deportation what can be said about the other restrictions the situation in Crimea in the media after the 24th of February has not seemingly changed. The internal pressure, the internal tension, if I were to speak about my newspaper, has gone up. But, by the, uh, but for the other media, they're in their natural element because the media and Crimea are also very different. And there are some that are fun funded from the budget. They are pro-Russian uh, authorities. And, uh, and obviously, uh, whoever pays can dictate what is uh, published. And uh, our newspaper is the only one, only newspaper that covers the persecutions, all of these horrible events. And we are the tribune for uh, the uh, for Nariman uh, Jalal for Seyran Mustafaev, Seyran Mustaliev, uh, the Ahtemov brothers. We, we publish their letters coming from the prison. And other media do not do this, uh, hopefully for now. Thank you. For uh, all your work uh, uh, and for the courage that you're staying in Crimea and continue your uh, journalistic work and uh, Especially, um, I think, for drawing attention to the problem of uh, lack of uh, medical treatment and uh, medical services to the political prisoners, which has led to the situation that in February this year, uh, the first time in the history of occupation of Crimea, two political prisoners died in captivity. Uh, Jamil Hafarov, uh, uh, who, whose uh, surname was mentioned, but also uh, Konstantin Shiring, 
and uh, uh, this situation uh, is uh, worrying because uh, uh, other political prisoners uh, also uh, lack of this uh, medical aid. And you might know about the case of Irina Danilovich, citizen journalist from Feodosia, who went on hunger strike uh, because of lack of uh, adequate medical treatment. Uh, therefore, we call uh, all uh, European countries uh, to uh, put attention and also to start urgent debates uh, uh, how to help uh, our political prisoners uh, who have serious illness uh, to people with disabilities, to elderly people who got very long terms as they may not live to be released. Uh, another issue that was mentioned is the uh, uh, pressure and persecution to human rights defenders and lawyers in Crimea. And now, uh, with growing list of political prisoners, there is no enough uh, possibilities, capacities to provide legal aid. At the same time, uh, Crimean lawyers are uh, threatened, deprived of their licenses. Uh, they receive fines and administrative arrest. And if before the large-scale invasion, they were those who can... Uh, speak loudly about the persecutions, now they are silenced too. So, uh, um, in this very grim situation, we also have a feeling as those human rights defenders who work with Crimean topics that it is uh, also overshadowed by the gravity of crimes that are committed by the Russian army in the newly occupied territories. And uh, we do all possible also to return uh, Crimea to the agenda uh, of the uh, democratic world. And uh, here I would like to pass the floor to Professor Andrew Wilson, uh, Senior Policy Fellow at the European Council on Foreign Relations. And uh, he's working also at the University uh, College London. So Professor, you are famous with your research of uh, Ukrainian history, but also modern Ukraine. Um, at the very end, do you have uh, some uh, positive uh, things uh, what might happen to uh, Crimea soon and what we might expect, what can happen with Russia? Uh, thank you. Uh, a pleasure to be here. Uh, Shalom Aleikum. Uh, Slava Ukraini. Um, I was also asked to talk about how the rest of the world sees Crimea. But something positive at the end uh, is uh, doable, yeah. Um, well, um, compared to 2014, there is more global solidarity with Ukraine, uh, but it's not universal. Uh, if we look at two UN votes, for example, in 2014, the condemnation of the uh, referendum in Crimea was passed by 100 votes to 11 against, with 58 abstentions. Uh, Whereas the vote in February, this February, on a comprehensive, just and lasting peace in Ukraine was passed by a much bigger number, 141, with only seven opposed and 32 abstentions. So better, but not universal support. Um, most of us in the West are part of the 141. So the problem is not uh, sympathy or support for Ukraine. Uh, but uh, there are problems, including a deeply problematical underlying failure to confront or even understand the mythology behind the idea of Russian Crimea, Ruski Krim, and, and call it what it is, which is uh, imperial mythology. The 32, ironically, are mostly in the global south. Now, the think tank that was mentioned uh, did some opinion polling throughout the world. Um, it's on its website, ecfr.eu. And uh, countries in the West, but also in the Global South, were asked, uh, do you see the war as um, Ukraino-centric, that the Ukraine supporters are defending Ukraine's territorial integrity and democracy? Or is the West defending its own dominance or own security, selfish reasons. And in the global south, if we can call Turkey that, uh, only 23% saw the West as defending Ukraine's territorial integrity and democracy. 65% uh, saw it as 
defending its own interests. Same in crime in China, 23% against 65. So it's deeply ironic that in the global south, Russia has some traction with its arguments or its propaganda that this is a war between Western imperialisms or is even an act of Western imperial imperialism uh, uh, acting against Russia. So to elucidate, this isn't just an imperial thing. It's a settler colonial thing that we have to understand. Not just a colonialism um, in Crimea, but the planting of outsiders on someone else's land, settlers. Um, and 1783, the date of the original annexation, really wasn't that long ago. Uh, and it's not that long ago since 80%, more than 80% of the population in 1783 were Crimean Tatar. Uh, and the rest actually weren't Russians at all. Uh, most of the rest were uh, Greeks and Armenians. It's really not that long ago since the 1850s, Crimean War, uh, when the Crimean Tatars were still the majority population. So the so-called golden age of uh, Russian Crimea is both a relatively new thing and a relatively short thing, if we date it from the 1850s to 1917. It's basically more or less the same length as Ukrainian Crimea uh, administratively from 1954 to 2014. Moreover, this uh, inflow of population is an ongoing process, given how rooted this paradigm of settler colonialism is. The current population, for example, is 2.4 million. As some have said already, um, uh, officially 53,000, but near 100,000 have been forced to leave. Uh, and probably about half a million have uh, settled in Crimea from Russia since 2014. So settler colonialism is ongoing. But even more telling figure, we go back to the summer of 1944, just after the deportations. The population of Crimea was 351,000. 351,000 out of 2.4 million today, meaning that the vast majority of the population of Crimea uh, is post-war in migrants, mainly from Russia. And the ideology of Ruski Krim or Rus Russian Crimea is loud and hyperbolic because that's what uh, settler colonial regimes always do. They can't tell uh, a more relaxed or a different story or a story of permanent settlement because they're settlers. So they do what settler regimes always do, uh, which is uh, to denigrate, deny and displace the indigenous population. So if you look at uh, Russian uh, historical mythology since 2014, a lot of which is recycled uh, from the era after 1944, when they first had to justify deportation, or from uh, the middle uh, of the 19th century, when again, uh, Tsarist historians had to justify a, a new Russian presence in, in, a, in a foreign land, basically. Uh, characteristic strategies are to retell hundreds of years of the history of the Crimean Khanate as just a kind of predatory raiding uh, experience, not a real state, not a real civilization, uh, to bookend, to squeeze those hundreds of years into irrelevance, to invent a myth of, of Russians being there before as well as being there after uh, from 1783 or, or even from the 1850s, uh, to talk about reconquista, uh, uh, as in the, the Spanish term for um, as they see it, reconquering uh, Al Andalus. Um, the displacement of a foreign Islamic element. This is how Russian uh, historiography presents it. So, here, and this is my op optimistic <laughs> ending bit, uh, if you ask for, uh, 
the Crimean platform is doing excellent work to combat this disinformation and to tell a true history, a proper reverse perspective um, to this uh, tragically ironic idea that Russian has that this is somehow uh, 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 a Western imperial adventure against Russia. This is the reverse. It is a Russian imperial uh, uh, phenomenon in Crimea. And Crimean Tatars themselves, personally, like Tamila Tasheva, the presidential representative, but also Maria Tomak in the uh, Crimean platform, are not only doing a, a, a great job in pushing back against that false view of history, but in themselves selling the Crimean story to that global sale, right. uh, particularly to its uh, Muslim parts. Uh, they're personally a bridge to this truer history uh, of the peninsula. Uh, and they are also selling the idea that a Ukrainian Crimea, a return to Ukrainian Crimea, would also be a bridge uh, because it's, it will be culturally heterogeneous, a cultural crossroads, a, a link uh, at the gate of Europe, uh, uh, linked to the new Silk Road from Central Asia, a new Mediterranean, a new Middle East, not, as in the Russian Crimea, an imperial outpost, not a settler population hostile to the indigenous people over whom they rule, uh, and not just a military base threatening uh, all of its neighbours. Russia's Syria operation would not have been possible uh, without um, control of Crimea. So that is my optimistic pitch of the Crimea we can get back. Thank you, Professor. Uh, dear colleagues, uh, uh, we are almost at the end of our uh, discussion, conversation, and uh, we can continue it uh, in a half an hour. Uh, we have another event uh, uh, linked uh, to our seminar. Uh, this is a photo exhibition, the stories from the occupied Crimea. Uh, this uh, photo, uh, photos were done by uh, three Ukrainian journalists, Alina Smutko, Taras Ibrahimov and Alona Savchuk. These were journalists who traveled to Crimea to film the realities, uh, the life uh, of the families of pol uh, political prisoners, uh, uh, political motivated court trials, uh, the life of families uh, whose uh, uh, children were abducted and uh, for uh, their work uh, in the occupied peninsula of Crimea starting from 2014 to 2019, all these three journalists were banned uh, uh, by the Russian Federation to enter Crimea and their travel bans were from 10 to 35 years. Of course, we uh, think that they might uh, return to Crimea earlier when Crimea will be liberated. So in a half an hour at uh, 5.30, we will uh, open uh, the photo exhibition. It is located in the Ukrainian hub um, near the entrance uh, to the European Parliament. So we warmly welcome you to join us and to go to see this photo exhibition where we can continue also our conversation. And one more event uh, will happen tomorrow um, at the permanent uh, representation of Poland to the EU. Uh, and there will be a docu documentary film screening about uh, Nariman Jalal, uh, the first deputy of the Majlis of Crimean Tatar people who is now imprisoned uh, in uh, the in Simferopol in the so-called CISO, the pretrial detention center number two. And this documentary, Nariman, the voice of Crimea, uh, is produced by my colleague Anna Tsihema. Uh, so we invite you tomorrow at 3 p.m. to the permanent representation of Poland to the EU to watch the film and also to talk to our guests. Uh, and we will hear, uh, I, I hope we will hear his wife, Levisa Jalalova, who will join uh, us online from Crimea. So now, colleagues, we invite you to the photo exhibition, which will be opened in half an hour. Thank you. Thank you very much indeed uh, for this participating in this seminar. Of course, I join Tatiana Pahonchik in uh, uh, 
uh, inviting all of you to to both uh, events. Maybe toward the end of seminar, I would like to to uh, inform you that uh, uh, do, uh, on uh, Poland's request. Uh, uh, in the 11th package of sanctions, now in the course of uh, adoption uh, uh, by the European Union, by the Council, there is uh, always provision for for sanctioning those who who are perpetrators of atrocities against Crimean Tatars. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you, colleagues, for your attention and for participation, and we invite you, invite you to join us and to continue.